September 30th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, Jeremiah chapters 13 and 14 from the Old Testament. The Lord said to me, Go and buy some linen shorts and put them on. Do not put them in water. So I bought the shorts as the Lord had told me to do and put them on. Then the Lord spoke to me again and said, Take the shorts that you bought and are wearing, and go at once to Parath. Bury the shorts there in a crack in the rocks. So I went and buried them at Parath as the Lord had ordered me to do. Many days later the Lord said to me, Go at once to Parath and get the shorts I ordered you to bury there. So I went to Parath and dug up the shorts from the place where I had buried them. I found that they were ruined, they were good for nothing. Then the Lord said to me, I, the Lord, say, this shows how I will ruin the highly exalted position in which Judah and Jerusalem take pride. These wicked people refuse to obey what I have said. They follow the stubborn inclinations of their own hearts and pay allegiance to other gods by worshiping and serving them. So they will become just like these linen shorts, which are good for nothing. For I say, just as shorts cling tightly to a person's body, so I bound the whole nation of Israel and the whole nation of Judah tightly to me. I intended for them to be my special people and to bring me fame, honor, and praise, but they would not obey me. So tell them, the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Every wine jar is made to be filled with wine. And they will probably say to you, do you not think we know that every wine jar is supposed to be filled with wine? Then tell them the Lord says, I will soon fill all the people who live in this land with stupor. I will also fill the kings from David's dynasty, the priests, the prophets, and the citizens of Jerusalem with stupor. And I will smash them like wine bottles against one another, children and parents alike. I will not show any pity, mercy, or compassion. Nothing will keep me from destroying them, says the Lord. Then I said to the people of Judah, Listen and pay attention. Do not be arrogant, for the Lord has spoken. Show the Lord your God the respect that is due him. Do it before he brings the darkness of disaster. Do it before you stumble into distress, like a traveler on the mountains at twilight. Do it before he turns the light of deliverance you hope for into the darkness and gloom of exile. But if you will not pay attention to this warning, I will weep alone because of your arrogant pride. I will weep bitterly and my eyes will overflow with tears, because you, the Lord's flock, will be carried into exile. The Lord told me, Tell the king and the queen mother, Surrender your thrones, for your glorious crowns will be removed from your heads. The gates of the towns in southern Judah will be shut tight. No one will be able to go in or out of them. All Judah will be carried off into exile. They will be completely carried off into exile. Then I said, Look up, Jerusalem, and see the enemy that is coming from the north. Where now is the flock of people that were entrusted to your care? Where now are the sheep that you take such pride in? What will you say when the Lord appoints as rulers over you those allies that you yourself had actually prepared as such? Then anguish and agony will grip you like that of a woman giving birth to a baby. You will probably ask yourself, why have these things happened to me? Why have I been treated like a disgraced adulteress whose skirt has been torn off and her limbs exposed? It is because you have sinned so much. But there is little hope for you ever doing good, you who are accustomed to doing evil. Can an Ethiopian change the color of his skin? Can a leopard remove its spots? The Lord says, That is why I will scatter your people like chaff that is blown away by a desert wind. This is your fate, the destiny to which I have appointed you, because you have forgotten me and have trusted in false gods. So I will pull your skirt up over your face and expose you to shame like a disgraced adulteress. People of Jerusalem, I have seen your adulterous worship, your shameless prostitution to and your lustful pursuit of other gods. I have seen your disgusting acts of worship on the hills throughout the countryside. You are doomed to destruction. How will you continue to be unclean? The Lord spoke to Jeremiah about the drought. 
The people of Judah are in mourning. The people in her cities are pining away. They lie on the ground expressing their sorrow. Cries of distress come up to me from Jerusalem. The leading men of the city send their servants for water. They go to the cisterns, but they do not find any water there. They return with their containers empty. Disappointed and dismayed, they bury their faces in their hands. They are dismayed because the ground is cracked, because there has been no rain in the land. The farmers, too, are dismayed and bury their faces in their hands. Even the doe abandons her newborn fawn in the field because there is no grass. Wild donkeys stand on the hilltops and pant for breath like jackals. Their eyes are strained looking for food because there is none to be found. Then I said, O Lord, intervene for the honor of your name. Even though our sins speak out against us, indeed we have turned away from you many times. We have sinned against you. You have been the object of Israel's hopes. You have saved them when they were in trouble. Why have you become like a resident foreigner in the land? Why have you become like a traveler who only stops in to spend the night? Why should you be like someone who is helpless, like a champion who cannot save anyone? You are indeed with us, and we belong to you. Do not abandon us. Then the Lord spoke about these people. They truly love to go astray. They cannot keep from running away from me. So I am not pleased with them. I will now call to mind the wrongs they have done and punish them for their sins. Then the Lord said to me, Do not pray for good to come to these people. Even if they fast, I will not hear their cries for help. Even if they offer burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Instead, I will kill them through wars, famines, and plagues. Then I said, O Lord God, look, the prophets are telling them that you said you will not experience war or suffer famine. I will give you lasting peace and prosperity in this land. Then the Lord said to me, Those prophets are prophesying lies while claiming my authority. I did not send them. I did not commission them. I did not speak to them. They are prophesying to these people false visions, worthless predictions, and the delusions of their own mind. I did not send those prophets, though they claim to be prophesying in my name. They may be saying, no war or famine will happen in this land. But I, the Lord, say this about them. War and starvation will kill those prophets. The people to whom they are prophesying will die through war and famine. Their bodies will be thrown out into the streets of Jerusalem, and there will be no one to bury them. This will happen to the men and their wives, their sons and their daughters, for I will pour out on them the destruction they deserve. Tell these people this, Jeremiah. My eyes overflow with tears day and night without ceasing. For my people, my dear children, have suffered a crushing blow. They have suffered a serious wound. If I go out into the countryside, I see those who have been killed in battle. If I go into the city, I see those who are sick because of starvation. For both prophet and priest go about their own business in the land without having any real understanding. Then I said, Lord, have you completely rejected the nation of Judah? Do you despise the city of Zion? Why have you struck us with such force that we are beyond recovery? We hope for peace, but nothing good has come of it. We hope for a time of relief from our troubles, but experience terror. Lord, we confess that we have been wicked. We confess that our ancestors have done wrong. We have indeed sinned against you. For the honor of your name, do not treat Jerusalem with contempt. Do not treat with disdain the place where your glorious throne sits. Be mindful of your covenant with us. Do not break it. Do any of the worthless idols of the nations cause rain to fall? Do the skies themselves send showers? Is it not you, O Lord, our God, who does this? So we put our hopes in you, because you alone do all this. God, I was uh, having a conversation with my sister a little while ago, and we were talking about free will and whether you truly gave us free will or not. And it's something that's been, as you know, debated for a very long time. There's not really any specific 
passage in the Bible that says you did or you did not give us free will. Um, there's areas that allude to both platforms or points of view. But part of this conversation Jeremiah is having with you is one of those areas that alludes to free will. That Jeremiah is so torn up by how this nation is treating you and more to his heart how you are treating them that he is pleading and begging and crying and weeping for them and you very clearly say no in fact <laughs> the next chapter we'll hear it even more clear uh, as you're adamant about no sorry until they changed their ways not your pleading Jeremiah but until they change their ways um, I I'm not only going to have nothing to do with them, but I'm also going to be intent on destroying them just to show them how serious I am. And Jeremiah keeps saying, but, but what about how this will look on you, God? If you're destroying your chosen people, how does this look on you? And part of what Jeremiah is failing to realize is it looks upon you, perhaps not favorably in the sense of coddling your nation, your chosen nation, but it reflects upon you that you're very clear about obedience. You're very clear about how we should live our lives. Um, there's not a whole lot of gray area <laughs> in that. that We should be obedient to you. And obviously they're not being obedient. And to the point that you don't even want to hear Jeremiah's intercessions for them. Don't even care, Jeremiah. Their choices are leading them to their destruction. Now both Jeremiah and I are very clear that you could save them. Jeremiah and I are on the same page that you are sovereign, that you could come in at any given moment and do anything that you want. And I think about that in relationship as we should with all the different areas of the Bible. I think about that in, in relationship to my own life and my own walk with you. That sometimes when I've gotten myself in a really bad situation, my cries of pleading to you seem to go unanswered. And they truly aren't unanswered. In fact, your silence is an answer. Or discipline that shows up suddenly on my front door is my answer. Just like Jeremiah's seen the answer for Judah. Very clearly he's seen the answer for Judah. Until my heart changes, until I choose to use the intelligence and the heart, the new heart that you've given me to make different choices and different path, pathways and to respond to things differently. There's not going to be a whole lot of coddling going on. Doesn't mean I haven't seen your grace and mercy in some of my low points of my life. I definitely without question have and I've seen that in other people's lives. But sometimes we don't need that as much as we plead and beg for it. Sometimes we honestly need to see the harsh reality of just how serious you are about our, obedi our, our obedience towards you, God. So God, no matter where we are today in our walk with you, whether we're in one of those times where everything is just going great and our relationship is just so love-filled and wonderful, or if we're in one of those really dark black times where we actually have the arrogance to say that you're not around us, that you've left us, um, that you are far away from us. Wherever we are on the spectrum, I know that you expect obedience of us. And obedience comes in many fashions and formats. And, and if we're in a good place where everything is all wonderful and love and uh, grace and mercy, then our obedience to you is uh, made very clear that we should worship you, glorify you, go and tell others about you. Sometimes when I think that we are in those dark spots, it has nothing to do with anybody else. Although other people are watching us, of course, but I think it really has to do with our relationship with you. That something has adjusted or changed in our hearts, and now our relationship is off. Not because of anything you've done, but because of something I've done. And my obedience at that moment means I need to change my heart. It's very difficult to worship you and glorify you and help other people and tell other people about you if my heart is wrong. It's almost a little bit like the praise and worship that you talk about with Jeremiah. I don't care if they offer sacrifices. I don't care if they go to praise and worship. I don't care if they do any of these things because their heart is wrong. So if, if anyone's listening right now, 
who is in that dark spot, God. Allow that obedience to the changes in their heart to happen. I do plead intercession on behalf of them for that. That they will see the truth. That they will see your love. And that they will be obedient to you. So that they can realize a fullness in that relationship. And so you can teach them whatever it is that needs to be taught in their life. So, just as you've told Jeremiah, you can go on to the bigger things. Really, if you can't deal with some of these smaller things, how am I going to get you to the bigger things I need you to do for my kingdom here on earth? God, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for loving us when things are going well. And I thank you for loving us when things are really, really dark. And responding out of love in both of those types of situations to us. Allow us to always see that as love from you. Whether it's in the form of grace and mercy or whether it's in the form of discipline. It all comes amazingly from the love that you have for us. In your son's name I pray. Amen.